A couple of years ago, if you'd asked me for a recommendation on a good budget GPU for less than the cost of a single game, well, it would probably have been an R9 270, maybe a 280 or 280X if your budget could stretch to it, but the GTX 670 would have been pretty high up the list. It might not have the same rabid fan club as those long-lived fine wine cards, but sometimes even those on a sub £50 budget have got green blood and wouldn't be caught dead with a Radeon. In the 2020s, however, I don't even recommend GCN1 cards that often, and I certainly don't recommend Kepler. What changed? What caused me to abandon NVIDIA's GTX 600 and 700 series? And have I made a mountain out of a molehill? I've detailed the downfall of the Kepler GPU architecture several times, and given that those videos have been pretty popular, I'm gonna assume I don't need to go over the whole sordid tale again. There's links in the description to my GTX 690 video and the collab I did with Hardware Lab if you've missed out. To sum up then, unlike their competitors HD 7000 and R9 series graphics cards, Nvidia's GTX 600 and most of the 700 series were built without emerging technologies that we now consider to be standard. The GTX 670, being part of the first batch of Kepler cards, didn't support DX11.1 or later, or asynchronous compute, and while Vulkan support would eventually be added, the architecture clearly wasn't built for it. While I'm not aware of anyone from Nvidia ever explicitly saying as such, the company's lack of support and optimization, especially compared to AMD's support for their equivalent products, hints that maybe Nvidia were aware that Kepler was a bit of an error. Like Nvidia, most people would suggest that gamers on a budget should just forget about Kepler and move on. Maxwell 2 and newer cards all represent better value and efficiency anyway, and the fact that they're compatible with almost everything just makes Kepler that much easier to ignore. Well, I fully agree. If you're looking for a practical piece of advice on what to do with your £50 budget, a GTX 950 or 960 or an R7 260X or RX 460 would all make much more sense. Of course, I've kind of already said that in my standalone reviews of several of those cards, which are linked below. In this video, I'm going to see how much life is left in the GTX 670, and if there's any way of extending that life further. To do so, I'm testing on my usual platform, the moderately priced gaming PC, with a Ryzen 5 5600G clocked at 4.6GHz with 16GB of RAM. So, let's start with the good news. When I tested the GTX 690 in single GPU mode, it would only run Cyberpunk 2077 at about 20 FPS on average, at 720 low. Whatever the reason, maybe power related, maybe SLI was somehow still messing things up. Anyway, the GTX 670 scored 50% higher, managing 30 FPS at the same settings. You might even be tempted to try out the new FSR2 upscaler to get a sharper image, but... Well, unfortunately that doesn't work, leaving everything rendered as black. Spider-Man's story isn't quite so happy. As you might have seen in a previous video, this game has an unfortunate tendency to lock up when loading textures. This is a real shame, as otherwise it could run at 36 FPS on average with some upscaling, but I don't think even the most patient of people would want to put up with this kind of thing. Red Dead Redemption 2 is another game that performs better on a GTX 670 than on a GTX 690 with one GPU disabled, though by a much smaller margin this time. At 720, with the slider pushed over to the highest favour performance setting, the game runs at 34.7 FPS on average compared to 32.6 on the GTX 690. I don't have the dual GPU card anymore to see what could have been wrong, but I'm still using the same drivers and I even overclocked the single GK104 to try and overcome any limitations, but I guess that 690's GPUs were even more cut down than I thought. Okay, now I'm convinced there was definitely something wrong with that GTX 690, or this GTX 670 is some kind of golden sample. I ran GTA 5 using the same mix of high and very high settings to make sure the game fit within the narrow 2GB frame buffer limit and I saw almost 88 FPS. This is only 4 FPS faster than the single GPU 690, but still, it really shouldn't be any faster at all. <laughs> 
Call of Duty Vanguard might not be everyone's idea of a good time now that Modern Warfare 2 is out, but I'm not refreshing my game's roster until the new year, so I guess you're stuck with it for now. I admit I was pleasantly surprised how trouble-free this was on the GTX 670, considering how Warzone 2 performs, but I'll get into that in a moment. Vanguard can run at 44 FPS at 1080 low, and if you don't mind the more compromised visual experience, I dare say dropping to 720 could reach 60 FPS. I'm an old man and my eyesight's not so good, so it's not a compromise I'd make, but you make up your own mind. Battlefield 5 was another shockingly good time on the GTX 670. DX11 is the only option, of course, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I haven't done a full set of tests yet to see what this game's deal is, so how much of this unexpected smoothness is down to the API and how much is down to the CPU is still a somewhat open question. Either way, 53 FPS in a large-scale multiplayer game released seven years after the graphics card is a decent result, even if it is only at 1080 low. From decent to downright incredible, again the GTX 670 beats the 690, although admittedly not in a fair test. I benchmarked Fortnite just after its latest update with a new map and changes to the back end of the game, so now the settings menu gives a warning that DX12 is not an option on these GPUs. At 1080 low with epic view distance, my standard competitive test setup for this game, the GTX 670 can run at 102 FPS with lows of 59 a good 15% or so up from the GTX 690 in single GPU mode. And Apex Legends again blows away the GTX 690. Honestly, I didn't intend this to become a competition between these two, but <laughs> here we are. On the SLI card, Apex scored 45 FPS, but exacted a terrible price on your eyeballs. With SLI disabled, the glitches went away, but performance lingered in the mid-40s. On the 670, minimums aren't much better, but averages hit 60, so while I don't think this is the ideal choice for playing Apex, it's better than brain damage. So this is where things take a nasty turn. This is the only footage I managed to glean from Warzone 2 on the GTX 670, and now the game refuses to launch. I'm not the only one who's had issues, as Random Gaming in HD showed in his GTX 760 video, a card built on the same GK104 GPU as this one. Funnily enough, the last time I tested Kepler's in this game's predecessor, it suffered from a very similar visual glitch that cast huge blocky shadows across the landscape. Last time I said that the now unsupported GTX 600 and 700 cards might end up being stuck with that bug being unfixed, but happily I was wrong about that. I don't want to make any predictions this time. As it stands, Warzone 2 is effectively unplayable on this family of GPUs. And while Warzone might be effectively unplayable, these titles are literally so. God of War now requires DX11.1 feature support as a minimum. Attempting to start the game on the GTX 670 just throws up an error message. There is a purported fix to this, which involves using DXVK to run the DX11.1 game in a Vulcan wrapper. Try as I might, however, I couldn't get it to work on my test PC. Forza Horizon 5 also refuses to start on this GPU, though I believe this is a relatively new development and it might have worked in the past. As I wasn't sure which DX features Forza was looking for, I placed both the DLL files in the game's root folder. Again, with both DXVK and VKD3D, the game was DOA. RIP. Halo Infinite? Well, if you're expecting a different ending, I'm sorry to disappoint you. On startup, Halo can't detect any compatible hardware and just returns to desktop. Again, whether using the DLLs from DXVK, VKD3D or both, the game just wouldn't start. Both Halo and Forza were the Games Pass versions, so that may have something to do with it, and I'd love to hear from anyone with Steam versions who can report back on whether or not DXVK or VKD3D work for them. So, do none of these homebrew patches work on the GTX 670? Well, not quite. I had one success in the form of Elden Ring. I'd been aware of this for a while, but the fix does involve disabling part of the game, and I wouldn't ordinarily suggest people actually go ahead and do that themselves. However, for science and the memory of Johann Kepler, I gave it a go. 
with the Vulcan wrapper files patched in, the executables backed up, the main EXE duplicated and renamed to overwrite the protected game EXE. Voila, it's alive. Now, the purpose of renaming the executables was to make sure the game couldn't run online, which would prevent the patch from working. The downside to this is, naturally, you've lost all online functionality of Elden Ring. On the positive side, the GTX 670 can manage a pretty playable 34 FPS at 1080 low. So, while it might not be pretty, at least it works. Have I changed my mind about the GTX 670? Was I making a mountain out of a molehill when I decided not to recommend it anymore? Well, no, and not really. The importance of DX11.1 and 12 functionality in 2022 and beyond is going to depend on the person. If you never had any intention of playing Forza Horizon 5, Halo Infinite, God of War, or any of the other titles I didn't test, like Assassin's Creed Valhalla, then you won't notice their absence. What I can't promise is that you'll never notice. Whether they're given away free by Epic or someone, or a game you actually want to play comes out that requires one of these APIs, there's always the chance that something will crop up that this card just can't run. As it stands, the GTX 670 isn't an awful buy. It can still outperform the i9 270, and it even comes close to the i9 280 and 280X in some titles, but its massive power demands and lack of present proofing, let alone future proofing, mean I just can't recommend it today. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.